Hi and welcome to Homo Ludens, the channel on history and board games. Thanks you, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, so good evening to everyone. Uh, so as a reminder, this is a live stream, so you might see that you can put some live comments uh, under the video, and I would be more than happy to bring the question to our panel tonight. Uh, and actually tonight, what we're going to do is something that we haven't really addressed a lot on this channel, and it's talking about art in war games. Uh, so for uh, this, uh, I invited a panel of artists that are working on game design and graphical design to talk about their art and about their approach and what they bring to the hobby. And they, the range of what they do goes from doing counters, doing cards, but also doing maps. And uh, some of them actually also design games. And it's a bit to talk about all this and the relationship between art and wargaming tonight. And I have three very talented guests uh, that I'm super proud to bring to the to the channel. And the three of them combined, I think I count for around uh, 60 war games. Uh, some of them are pretty big ones. So I'm pretty, pretty happy to have them. And I think it's going to be a fun chat. Uh, first, we have uh, Niels uh, Johansson. Hi, Niels. Hi. Hello. Then we have Don Hegarty. Hi, Don. And Hello. finally, we have Ivan Ivan. <laughs> I would like to say in French, Ivan Caceres. So, uh, as you can see, there is a strong, uh, a strong European focus uh, for uh, for that panel, uh, and that's uh, that's maybe not by accident. Uh, I'm actually pretty uh, happy with that uh, with that choice. Even if done, we could argue that uh, you more or less abandoned the old uh, the old world because now you're living in the US, but uh, it's still it's still European focus. I'm 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 living on the frontier. I'll give that. <laughs> yes, exactly. You're in a gray area. That's what you are. But uh, first of all, I would like to thank the three of you for joining the show. Really appreciate that you are taking the time to to talk about your work. Um, I'm super excited to have you uh, to have you here. I uh, already worked with Don, but I must say, and I'm going to start with this. My plan as a war game designer is actually to find a way to work with each of you separately on a different game. So that's going to oh. be my objective for Ooh. for the coming years. So Don, check. Uh, now I have uh, Ivan and Niels to to check, but I'm I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> No, but seriously, it's, you it's need really to come cool. back to me too, though. You can't. You're, you're, oh yeah, no, no. I'm not going to do only one with you, Don. Uh, yeah, you're you're on my list. I need to do a, a couple of other things with you. But it's uh, it's really great to have you here. And we have in the chat David Thompson. Hey, David, really cool to have you here. That's always nice. Hi, I think that maybe yeah, maybe some of you are also on uh, David's uh, hit list. Um, so that's that's really nice. And we have Ooh. also Jan from Let's Play History. So hey, Jan, nice to have you. So that's uh, so that's it for 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 a quick intro, just to give a bit of an overview. And as I was saying to uh, to uh, to the three of you uh, before we started the stream, so the idea is to talk about uh, the art in general, and I really want you to have no limits on how deep you want to go in the discussion. I really want to understand how you approach your work when it comes to board game uh, graphical design. I do have a list of questions that I want to go through, and we'll use this as a red thread to go through the discussion. But really, feel free to. Uh, to go on, on the side. And for the people in the chat, if there are questions that you want to ask, please feel free to do so. More than happy to uh, uh, to bring your question on screen. Um, but maybe just to start, to give a bit of context to the people that might or might not know you, I think it would be nice for each of you to introduce yourself and maybe um, talk about uh, a couple of games that you worked on uh, recently. And actually, I'm going to go in a clockwise order. And I'm going to start with you, Niels, if that's OK. OK. Uh, so I provide uh, graphics essentially for DDP companies and smaller publisher. Uh, I'm doing this on my spare time, uh, on and off since 2010. I usually work on each project as a complete package, so meaning map, counters, uh, player aid, uh, covers. Uh, I even uh, rewrite rules whenever necessary. And uh, what else can I say? Um, on the design spectrum, I'm, as you as you mentioned, Fred, I'm probably more on the European side of uh, design. I tend to rely more on illustrations, uh, hand-drawn elements, and I'm blending the various techniques into the um, onto the playing board. Uh, my main focus is uh, the full immersion into uh, into a theme or a period, and to have all components reinforce the storytelling aspects. Uh, by day, I work in uh, fashion. I'm a stylist, uh, and uh, up to very recently, I was the visual di merchandising director for Prada and Miu Miu in Asia. And now I'm a retail consultant in Paris. So. And that's it. 
Great, but thanks, Niels. That's uh, actually I didn't expect you to. And actually, when I see you dressed, I, I, it makes sense now. <laughs> I, I, I understand, but I, I didn't expect you to have a, a background in fashion. That's super interesting. I think I'll go back to that to see if there are bridges between the because I guess there are uh, some bridges between the the two ways of working. But we'll talk about it later. I'm a note for them for myself. Go ahead, Don. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um. Out of twenty twenty odd years, uh, started in, um. Uh, sort of pre-press behind the scenes, doing a lot of the technical stuff, then moved into uh, graphic design and fine art, sort of parallel, but never really crossed over. Um, I spent most of my, most of the 20, I've been here in the US 20 years, first 10 years, I was doing mostly commercial stuff, uh, industry, uh, you know, Fortune 500 stuff, which is soul destroying. And then uh, an off chance, I, um, Mark Sim uh, Simonich did put out a, I called for uh, designers. I showed them some some stuff I'd just done for fun, um, some maps and stuff, and I'd thrown up on BGG, and it kind of snowballed from there. Um, about 18 months ago, I decided to go out on my own because I want the flexibility of being able to move around. And I'm trying to build up and replace my sort of business stuff with board game design work. Um, mm -hmm. My I, I think because I'm coming from technical, I'm always thinking very technically about stuff. Um, it, a lot of a lot of things I try and do, I try and mimic print techniques of periods and so on. Um, I think my 19, 1960 uh, uh, president of one is a good example of where I was trying to mimic period, sort of stylized. Um, but, I think, but I think we're getting into some of the questions that Fred wants. Yeah, to, you know, so I, I, yeah I was about to, to tell you, Don, please, please stop, please stop, stop <laughs> talking right now. It's like you're breaking my whole stream, of, like my, the, the whole the whole swim for me to you. And that's, Ivan? What I, that's what Irish people do. We're here to spoil the party, right? And Ivan? Uh, I studied finance a long time ago. And then uh, after working, I usually work uh, for illustration for textbooks, uh, technical books. And then I started um, doing tattoos. I've been tattooing for 15, 20 years. Uh, I own two uh, tattoo studios. Um, seven years ago, I, I, I wanted to start to design my own game as I always loved uh, games, uh, especially historical war games, and I thought I had the skills to design my own game, the whole product, not only the the game but the graphical. I wanted it was a thing I wanted to try to achieve to get it to to publish. At the time, there wasn't uh, so many war game publishers, but uh, Mm, that was my first game, Santa Cruz, uh, 1797. Yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah. And, <clears throat> and, and then I started to focus on what I think I do best, which is uh, graphic design, but focus it on, on games. Um, and projects started to arise um, from seven years ago. Things just uh, went like a snowball, um, bigger and bigger um, uh, projects. Um, here, here I am. <laughs> But thanks for for each of uh, of your introduction, and it's uh, it's interesting because yeah, you mentioned Santa Cruz, uh, seventeen ninety seven. So that I have here, and I actually uh, got mm -hmm. after trying von Menschen's Triumph during the Yotacon uh, because it was the same system, and I and I just needed that game as soon as I uh, as I played it. And when I tried this, I, I I was amazed by the art also. And I think that David has a question about it. Actually, Niels, the first game that I have from you is this one. The bon first one. Yeah, that, that, yeah. Actually, I have no other games from you. That's the that's the that's the the, the first and only. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the first least, uh, Ma Maori Wars. To, uh... Yes, I'd like to have to try Maori War. I, I have some. I have a friend that um, that has it in London and that uh, suggested to me, and it looks amazing. And that's also one of the on the top of my list. And then Don, I think the first one that I got from you is Labyrinth. That is here. Yeah, you did the map over there. 
uh, but uh, but yeah, so that's the way I actually discovered I think uh, each of, each of you in a in a different ways. But all of you, you seem like you had careers before, from what I hear and from what you said. Mm -hmm. And actually, done the first thing that I saw from you was I think it was a fan map art for Crusader Rex that I saw yeah. on BGG that <laughs> was mind blown about, and I was that's like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. But you all had a, a bit of a career before, and I was actually wondering, as a, maybe a first question uh, beyond the introduction, is why did you start making art for war games? Because you're all super talented. You could do things that actually, like, would be more. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, would have a greater audience. Would be. Uh, would maybe bring more money, of course. But uh, but uh, like, what dro dragged you into war game? Because I guess. I, I, it's not a secret where gaming is not really a, a, a billion dollar market. It's just a, it's only um, it's only fan projects uh, bought by 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 fan players and everything. But what dragged you into uh, into war gaming specifically? And maybe we can uh, I, I would change the order a bit to make it exciting. So maybe we're starting with you, Don. Uh, um, I uh, my very first game was Monopoly, but I think the second board game that I cared about was um, Napoleon's Last Battles, the TSR reprint of the old quad game. Hmm. Um, it just really made sense to me. Now, these days, I pick up very, very few Hex Encounter games because I'm looking for, for sort of new ideas and thoughts and does it inform you know, that sort of different thing. The reason I started doing them was because I needed a vent. And while I was doing my own sort of fine art and doing occasional exhibitions, um, the hobby was a way for me to sort of like day by day, sort of like, because I was working in um, uh, agencies. So I was selling cigarettes, um, alcohol, um, pesticides, herbicides, uh, international travel. So everything I was doing was morally questionable. <laughs> um, and, and sort of get, it just seemed a place where I could give something back to a community that I thought was, I'd always felt was very friendly um, and very open. Um, that, for games that were no longer available, so people could get the board, put the pieces together, and, and that was sort of another drive for just a lot of the things I tended to do were things that you couldn't get at the time. Um, that's, I mean, that's sort, that's sort of it. it. Was kind of a way to give it a little bit back to a hobby that didn't meant a lot for me, um, and sort of it kept me sane through my my high school years. Um, okay, so it's yeah. At some point, you just wanted to go back to to a, a passion that you had as a. As a, and you are you still a big a big war game player uh, today or I, I play I well I've got a six year old and a twelve year old so I'm beginning to start playing them again because my twelve year old is just old enough to start playing some of them yeah so that's you know and the some and he, you know it's funny because he played some Mexican counters like me but I start playing and you coin with him and he's like Ooh. Yeah. Right, I might have a I might have a game for him uh, <laughs> just I don't know if you checked uh, P five hundred recently oh that would be involving I, you know Mennonites would it be yes so exactly yeah. so, I just saying I, I'm not I, I'm not saying that I'm doing my channel for promoting my own games only <laughs> but I'm just saying that th this game is there you might be interested in it yeah and it's it that, that's you know the sort of that sort of first there's an eight year period and a ten year period with your kids when they're if you start shoving these things down their throats they're not going to play them but we played a lot of other kind of you know sort of kid oriented board games and they're now moving into sort of more interesting so I've got something to game with and then they're going to go to college. I don't have anybody to game with, and then they're just back in college, and you know, so that's the cycle I'm, I'm hoping for. Short window, and you, Ivan. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, the, yeah, the question was you. You all, you all had a, you all have a, a career before, and also on the ah, side yeah, of, yeah, of, yeah. Your, of being a what brought you to actually uh, starting doing some 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 art for for war game uh, for war games. What brought you in, into yeah, what decided you to actually spend some yeah, of your, yeah, a lot yeah. of your time and energy doing this. I always did like uh, you know um, some tweaking for the games uh, for friends. Uh, I love uh, I I always think about gaming, you know, uh, making campaigns. Uh, I have a lot of um, uh, role playing campaigns uh, that I had uh, all drawn up, all the papers more more <laughs> more drawing than than text. Yeah, uh, that's that's my way of. That's how it was like my main hobby. So I just wanted to to work on what I love. No. Yeah. Uh, I just thought it. I just thought it. It wouldn't be possible at the time to to make a living of this, but lately I'm changing my mind a bit. <laughs> 
So I enjoy so much uh, just drawing games. Okay, and and you, Niels, what 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 decided you to to spend a significant uh, amount of of time and energy on on doing war games? Well, I had uh, I had done some gaming in my uh, my teens. I'm talking about uh, early to mid uh, 80s here, which gives you an idea about my age. Uh, nothing too hardcore, but. Um, I was sufficiently immersed in, in the gaming scene to have a, a regular group of friends, role-playing, uh, war games, of course, so Call of Cthulhu, Merp, uh, Paranoia, for those who know about this, and um, maybe the, the, the real uh, icing on the cake would be um, uh, weekend-long uh, double-blind uh, games, war game games. And uh, and I was actually in charge of preparing all the documentation, all the material, you know, like uh, the period uh, period documentation. And uh, and I think there's something uh, which you can still find. Uh, you can still see some resi uh, residuals, you know, like some traces in my in my current uh, in my current projects. And uh, of course, this was my my teens. Uh, I uh, fast forward to 2010. I had completely forgotten about all about all this, and uh, I think just randomly I, I just uh, bumped into uh, BGG, uh, the board game geek, and I was surprised to see that there was still uh, uh, a vibrant uh, war game scene, and um, and uh, and I decided to uh, to try to do some maps again, you know. So it's uh, I think. The, um, there's something probably something else also in in the sense that I had a, maybe a disposition like in, in the family um, military history was uh, probably imbued with uh, positive values which also also help you know and it was just uh, the opposite in my family it was just uh, the yeah, opposite me too. yeah yeah. Uh. And then uh, coming back to wargaming, or uh, disco rediscovering wargaming, um, I actually, um, how can I say this? I thought it represented an interesting combination, you know? It's, uh, it's almost uh, the most incredible nexus, you know, of uh, human uh, ingenuity, you know? It's a, it's a nice combination of uh, scholarship, uh, historical knowledge, you know, like statistics, m math, uh, data visualization, and uh, I thought it would be, it represented like really a, a, a strong effort, you know, and uh, yeah, it's, I, I think you know, even as a player, even uh, besides designing, it's an incredible uh, experience, cognitive experience, you know. So yeah, it's uh, maybe um, maybe on a deeper level. Uh, I don't, I don't necessarily see this as a, as a retreat from reality, for example, contrary to what you could imagine from outside, you know, gaming, tanks, you know. And, uh, I think it's, uh, it's actually uh, my way of making sense of, uh, in, of, the, of the increasing complexities all around us, you know. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a nice way to keep your mental uh, faculties uh, intact, you know, especially in a, in, a, in a world of uh, reduced narratives or... Of lack of big ideas, you know. If you if you want to stay uh, fit mentally, you know, pick up a war game or just uh, rewatch uh, Carl Sagan's uh, Cosmos series, you know, for example. So, it's it's an interesting parallel, but I but I agree a, a lot on this. It's a it's a very challenging and, and enriching cognitive experience because it's not only about playing; it's also about learning in a very interactive way. And I I really follow you on that. And actually, it gives me a transition to a. A question that David is asking, and I think goes in the direction of something that I would like to ask you guys about. And let's start with David's question, and then I will open it up. But David has a specific question for Ivan about Santa Cruz. Um, uh -huh. Because on that game specifically, Ivan, you had uh, two um, hats, you could say. You were the graphic designer, but you also designed your own game. Um, uh -huh. And he and David here is actually asking about what do you think are the pros and cons uh, for being the artist of your own uh, design? Mm, well, the, uh, the thing is, uh, well, it's, it's the best thing. The best thing is you do the, the whole product. You have the the control, the, the total control of the product. You know it to the to the last. You don't have to 
to get explanations. I usually I'm lazy about uh, reading role books, so I try at least to to play the game <laughs> with the designer to to avoid uh, you know losing time and uh, or to just to um, uh, to be clear graphically to to be um, uh, you know, to be, uh, I don't know how to say this, uh, to get the graphic design to explain itself, uh, don't have to, to, to read the rule book too much. Um, so, um, uh, the thing is, if you, you know, the topic in Santa Cruz, which, which was a topic I knew very well because it's a battle about my my own city. And it was it was very dear to me. Um, I was uh, able to 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 get documentation from the local museums, so I I didn't have to hurry to to make all the illustrations. So I I. I got to to do each illustration in the card uh, with watercolor, taking my time, not uh, rushing. So it was not the usual work for me, you know. I had it on my own. Uh, I did it on my own pace, um, and giving it all the love I had. Even if I see it now. With, 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 with my eyes now, I see all the flaws in the, yeah. in the design, in the illustrations. But anyway, uh, don't, don't think, it. don't yeah, don't think about it. <laughs> it's just been very <laughs> insane. Not think about it. Yeah, everything is related by what you did wrong. Yes, I, you know how much or how little you got wrong in it. And, I, and 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 that opens up to the question that I actually wanted to 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 address to to uh, to all of you is actually what's your relationship with the with the design itself so, so the game and the designer and 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 I start with you Niels to see what kind of relationship you have with the game designer how do you work with them how do you approach the game uh, is it important for you to to play it a lot uh, do you need a, a constant interaction with the designer how what's your kind of working relationship for um... It's uh, yeah. Usually, I would I would try to play the game, even if it's uh, even through the rule books, or I would try to set up a prototype. But I would actually, uh, as much as possible, uh, put myself in the uh, in the position of the player, you know, to just just go to, just to get a feel of the mechanics. Absolutely. And uh, the, the relation of the designer, it's something um, it's something interesting in the sense that the designer would probably uh, bring me a very structured approach, you know. It's uh, again. I tend to um, I tend to go for uh, lots of ideas and different approaches. I would uh, I could really go uh, take a uh, design uh, into exper in, in, more into the experimental side. So the designer for me are very important because they will uh, actually structure the whole exercise. You know, they will. Uh, hmm. It's uh, it's a way. It's uh, I don't know. I, I, I could define this as a, as a voluntary uh, servitude. You know, it's uh, it's a way for me to to get even more creative, but with, with staying within boundaries. You know, so and um, but usually the, my interaction with the designer comes maybe in uh, a, a bit later. I would get the essential, of course. This is something probably we will see also in the. Yeah. But I would get examples, and uh, I would uh, work on my side, and would get back to the designer only when I have something ready, 70, 80% ready. Okay. And then the real relation would start, like fine tuning, uh, tweaking the different components and yeah. And, and you done, how do you approach the relationship with the design the, and, the, and the game itself uh, when you're working on, uh, on this? Keep in mind that I will ask you about your whole process afterwards on the research and everything. Just read on, on the okay. on the okay. relationship okay. with yeah. the game design itself. Yeah. I'm glad you cut me off there because I'm going to launch it. the process. Yeah, no, um, <laughs> I saw yeah, it right, and I was like, Don is going to go too far. He's going to go too far. It's, it's really helpful, and it, it, it isn't always necessarily that I want that I need to talk at length with the designer. Uh, like we did a playthrough with Red Flag, and that really sort yeah. of made things very very clear. It's a very it's a very simple structure. 
um, to sort of wireframe out, and you already had sort of very clear board that to, to work on. Uh, so I'm um, I tend to I always play the game if I possibly can multiple times, and mm -hmm. a lot of times I'll just do this turn. So I'll try and figure out what bits I need to have where to do this part of the turn. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was doing Fields of Fire for GMT, I, I mocked up a couple of the cards, and I, and I was just using sort of you know little counters that I'd just written some stuff on, and I was figuring out how it physically worked, because because that game is you're basically you've got you know a layout of deck a deck of cards, and then you're placing out counters between the cards and on the cards, and so the physicality of what you're doing makes a difference, and you end up putting things in the wrong damn place. So it gets, gets covered up or you can't see it or you forget that it's there or it's the wrong color. You have to get a, that sort of wireframe out of the way so you know what your canvas is. And what, for me, what the designer does is he's laid out, a graphic design, the game designer has, has created a framework. I think myself less as an artist in a lot of ways as more of an artisan where I'm saying I'm, I'm being challenged to make something creative within this frame to support this mm -hmm. thing. Because if I make a beautiful thing that you can't read, um, um, what was it, Indonesia back back in the day, or there was one on Intel named after an Italian city. That it was very difficult to read the board. I mean, once you learned the board, it was fine, but you couldn't read the board most of the time. It was beautiful, but it, the, the the frame wasn't there for the person to play the game. And the beauty should sort of support the flavor, the feel, the vibe, the narrative. But if there's no fra wireframe, and that's what the designer gives you is that wireframe that you're building around, that your hanger that you're putting your clothes on. Mm -hmm. And and actually, I, I'm, I, this could, makes a good transition to one of the questions that I had earlier in the in in the chat. Um, so, and I'm going to bring a, a couple of questions from the chat to to address them, um, and then be, before going back to the flow, there was a, a question here about uh, how do you strike balance between style and usability in game art, and I think it it relates a bit to what you were saying about playing the game, figuring out how the components are being used. Uh, and, and making sure that you that you have uh, that you have this in mind. So I don't know if any of, of, of you three need to or feel inspired by the question and, and want to. Yeah, I, I have a couple of because it's a little on the tactical side, and I, I, like I said, I came out of the tactical end of the business. One of the things I do when, when I do do a board game is I do a layout. So I do a wireframe, and then I do and I do it to scale. I don't make it full scale, but I, you know maybe half scale or third scale, and then I start drawing in circles to indicate reach of the player. Where's the player? Sitting, where can they reach? What, and then working out each sort of chunk of the of the of the game. I understand what's happening in it, so I need to know what needs to be visible at any given point in time. So that then gives me a, a thing, a framework, sort of a, sort of a physical pattern that I can sort of. So I I know I can I that I can't change I can't cover this up. Or I can't change it without coming up with an equal uh, but different solution. So it's a way for me to flag where I need to watch. It's like stakes in the ground. I'm building a house. I can't move those stakes unless I know I have to redesign my architecture. And that's how you know that's it. it they're guidelines, but I can't. I I, I lay them out first. And that's mm -hmm. sort of like and the, and the game structure gives me that. Um, like the gameplay gives me that. Okay, that's, I think it's an interesting point. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bring another question, and I think I would give this one to uh, to uh, to Niels because it, it it connects a bit to a chat that we had separately on via DM on, on Twitter. But uh, Emilia is asking, do you have any uh, do you have a bucket list of types of game or periods of history that you would like to create art for? Mm, I don't know a bucket list, maybe not, but uh, I think. Um, Usually, I, I read a lot uh, military history, so it, it would come after a long period of reading on, on one topic or on subject. I would think about uh, the book. I would think about a possible game or a, a way to represent uh, the visual imagery uh, for that area. And then I would start looking out for projects uh, that <laughs> fit uh, books, for example. So, mm -hmm. But no, no, no bucket list. I mean... Uh, I take what uh, what comes, you know. So it depends on the, really on my reading. So it could be uh, now I'm reading something about um, the Algerian independence uh, war. So uh, probably I will be looking out for something that uh, talks about the battle, the battle of Al Algiers, for example. It would be really interesting because uh, there's a couple of good games, so very good games actually. Um, 
But uh, the Battle of Algiers, you know, and especially I'm thinking about the movie uh, from uh, Gillo, uh, Gillo or Ponte Corvo. Yeah. It would be interesting to, to be able to translate this into a, a playing board, you know, and to, to capture that mood, for example. So, yeah, but that's no a really, yeah, that's mm -hmm. a really interesting one. But I, I think you, at some point during our chat, you were talking about 19th century France, uh, late 19th century also. Uh, but yeah, but I, yeah. Anyway, and you, Ivan, do you have do you have anything that you're like that you have on your bucket list of topics that you would like to go through periods yeah, or specific uh, kinds of games? I will like uh, now it's in bulk. I will like to do a Cold War game. I haven't done because that was the uh, <laughs> the time when I grew up with the nuclear minis, um, mm. that kind of stuff, and um, I think it's very imbricated in my in my in my graphic in my imaginary you know uh, anyway anything but uh, medieval spain <laughs> yes. of, i guess you must I be about, sick of it <laughs> i was about to say this i'm sure that it's also a reaction to what you yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and be yeah, careful yeah. don't say too many mean things because volko is in the chat so so don't say, so be careful Ivan. be careful Ivan. just i'm just saying i just want to warn you He's here. He's watching. So, so, so be very but careful. It is true. Yeah. I mean, as a, as a, as a, as an artist, you have to, if you work a lot on something, you tend to go for the opposite after the opposite extreme. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. um, I'm, I'm working on a game on, for example, a, a, um, a possible uh, conflict in in the Lebanon, for example, and uh, it's it's just perfect. It was perfect because after all, after the battle of the. Uh, Northwest series and uh, Indians, you know, and uh, it was it was the the exact opposite, you know. So it was like a a, a breath of fresh air for me. So, mm -hmm. but it's, it's it's funny because we have the same discussions with the game designers. Uh, and for example, now right now, there is nothing that would make me more sick than go back into um, uh, 1870 France. I cannot. I don't want to hear about it. And it's really tough because right now in France, everyone talks about the commune because it's the 150 yes. years anniversary. And I've been eating stuff about the commune for the last three years and I'm sick of it and I don't care and I don't want to know anything about it. It's like, no, 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 no. I want to do something really far away from that. It's just sickening. You're in um, a speaking of terrible France, moment where you have France. the sales pitch. Really yeah, yeah. But really and I did my... It. Yeah, it's yeah. horrible. I actually did my last presentation to the um, to the to the Italian convention, so the few uh, uh, convention. So I did my last presentation for Red Flag, and I and I told them it's the last one that I'm doing. I don't want to talk about this game anymore. <laughs> Give me two years. It's I'm tired. I have a question here from Alan that I think is 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 a quite interesting one. Uh, asking, do you think that compelling graphics can make a mediocre game better? Um, and or and the other side, do you think that disappointing graphi graphics can can make an interesting game actually less interesting? And I would say just for the record, before asking your point of view specifically, Don, that I think that in the end, Red Flag Over Paris is <laughs> is good mostly because the artwork is really awesome. <laughs> I think most of the um, interest that I got from the game was on the fact that you actually beautified the prototype and then you made an amazing work on it. It's and it looks way better than what it actually is. But yeah, go ahead. No, I, 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 I fundamentally disagree. If there's not if there's no substance, it's it's a, it's a piece of cardboard and it falls over, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. need to be something. Um, it's it's there's there's. I had an art lecturer who once, um, he, he also taught graphic design, which is why we, we got along because I wanted to do graphic design, not just fine art. Um, and he said to me that, um, and I've had the similar things from, from, from other art directors all the time, is that when you get it right, no one notices. When you get it wrong, everyone notices. And, and the caveat, and there's a second part of that, which is um, or, uh, the, the extension of that is, is that if you, um, if you have something substantive, people don't have the imagination to see what it could be mm. visually because they're not trained. In the same way, a physicist might walk in and look at an equation and go, oh, that changes everything. And you go, it's a math question, dude. I have no idea what you mean. It's the same thing. We're trained to look for possibilities in that area. And so I think the same way a game designer comes in, sees a game and goes, oh, that mechanic, I can, I can finally do my Save the Titanic game, right? There's the, the it's it's a moment of creativity, and the closer you can, once you can put it in a framework that people go, oh, I see it, 
even if it's not the finished product, you get the direction they go. I get it. And then, of course, there's also the thing of it's moving from, you know, sort of, you know, airware to real thing because there's artwork put into it. So it, there's, there's a couple of things, I think, going on that that make a game sort of get people excited about it. But it, all the bits have to be good. Mm -hmm. what, what's your point of view on this event? What, like being on, you've been on the both sides of the, of the, I don't know if you can say that, both sides of the barrier or, but you've been, yeah, you've done some game design, but also a lot of graphic design. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, graphics can make a game better or, or, or actually bad mm -hmm. graphics mm -hmm. could have an impact on a game? Uh, I know for sure that bad graphics don't attract me in a, in a shelf, mm. you know? And even if the game is so good and got good critics, I can't enjoy the game the same, the same way yeah. that it, if it is a, a beautiful game, you know? And on the other side, I can, I don't know if it's, uh, um, if uh, it's an effect of my profession, but if uh, a game is so beautiful, I I just enjoy it for the for the graphics. For example, uh, uh, you know, most of Neil's of mm -hmm. uh, games are I just <laughs> I just enjoy it. But looking at looking at them, maybe it's a good game or a, or a or a bad one, but I don't care. There, I, I have two copies of Maori War because I want to frame with I want to frame the map. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's and people people look at it and go, that's a historic map. I said, nah, it's not. <laughs> Forever bastard, and he, you know, it's it's it, it 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 makes it does make a difference, you know. But but I mean, people yeah. play train games, and a lot of them are to me are like, oh, uh, I can't. Uh. And there are games, nah. very very popular top 100, top 50 BGG games. I can't play because of the font choice. And because of the illustrations. Now, part of that is I'm trained to have an aesthetic sensibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and I think there are a lot of people who have the different taste to me. I won't say a bad taste, but different taste to me, who are absolutely happy with that and they don't mind mm -hmm. any great to them. So it's it's what your expectations are. And it's mm -hmm. very hard to guess what your particular audience expectations are. So, yeah. And is it the same for you, Niels? You think that uh, like a good game would only be good if it's good, and then art just makes it uh, even more enjoyable. But bad no, art I, can I, actually impact a game. What do you think? Uh, no, I agree with uh, both uh, Donald and uh, and Ivan. It means that I'm I'm probably more forgiven, uh, forgiving for uh, uh, compelling graphics and uh, mediocre game than the opposite uh, case. It means that, uh, uh, for example, I, I used to. Um, I'm a, I'm a collector, I'm a game collector also. So I used to buy every possible release out there, you know, so, and at some point I just stopped. I, I, I just couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't enjoy it anymore because even if the game was rated very high, I probably wasn't enough of a player to, to overcome the, the graphics or the choices behind the graphics, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and I'm going to stop with the question from the chat because I think that's a perfect segue into the the next question that I had for for each of you. And I wanted to have a more uh, in depth question about what's your work process when you get a project, you decided that you're going to work on it. And for example, I think Maori War is a really good example. How do you approach this? How do you? Where do you start from? Uh, what, what's your? Do you get documented? Uh, what, what kind of research do you do? What, what's the? Because you're saying that you're actually going up to 70, 80 percent before talking to the designer. Those 70, 80 percent. How do you spend that time? How do you work on this originally? It's uh, it's a very uh, I don't know. I guess I can say this. It's a subjective perception. You know, it's something very personal. It's uh, it's almost pure form. Um, it's um, it's like an, an an autonomous vision. You know, that's uh, uh, that I propose to the designer again. Um, Previously, I used to approach designers, so I would come up with a finished product. It means that I would have a specific idea, and uh, and I would just propose a draft, you know, and they would take it or they would not take it. But uh, but I mean, how do you get to that draft? What's your process? What's what? How? Where do you get inspiration from? Like, what are the different oh, steps? Yeah. 
Oh, that's uh, that could be a long, long conversation. Um, <laughs> that's why we're here. My <laughs> main source is, uh, I think I mentioned this in the, it, it's movies, 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 t t uh, typography and, uh, and charts. When I say charts, it's, for example, reading uh, old uh, handbooks for tanks or uh, bomber manuals, you know, it's, it's it's absolutely fantastic, you know, like the the, uh, the infographics in these kind of manuals uh, and the color use and and the printing process at that time was you could you could see all the details. It it gives you a flavor, you know. It gets it's uh, it's helping a lot. And then movies, uh, a lot of movies. So I would start project by uh, watching movies. And, and I watch a lot of movies. Yes. So you, yeah, okay, that's interesting because so you, you're looking into technical manuals and everything, and even you were saying earlier that you you actually used to work on technical manuals earlier in your career. Do you mm -hmm. think that you by accident you actually made material for future war game graphic designers? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> I need to ask. You know, so maybe there was an infinite loop of actually even making like actually having influence no, no, on no, war no. games from 2060 or something like this. I don't feel like there's a link between the, the, the two works, you know. Uh, but anyway, I see a, I see a lot of, of technical. Uh, I usually like to to to, to document in the period kind of print process or, or or graphical styles to see what I can grab from that and and give the feel of the period to the game. So. I usually download every Osprey book about the topic, uh, uh, and I read. I try to read a lot, but most of all, I I see pictures. You know, I see pictures uh, to see what I can grab from there, from that, or from this. I see a lot of uh, uh, more than movies. The the um, and the posters, movie posters, mm, and there's yes. a lot of uh, sources from that, and um, from you know written um, written documents, and the, the type of illustration. And um, from that point, I get a draft. I normally get lucky enough to get it approved. Um, from that point, I start to. I usually work first uh, in the cover of the game, and um, from that point, be, and it's because I enjoy it the most too. So uh, from that point, I get the overall look of the game, uh, the palette I want to use. Um, usually, use a restraint palette because I'm awful with colors and that way <laughs> I can overcome that. Um, and from that, from the cover, I do the rest of the game, usually. It's interesting. I never imagined that you could start from the cover and then, mm. yeah, develop after that. And, and you, Don, what's your, your approach when you start to work on a game? What's your research process? Where do you start from? How do you... I am I am continuously and ever collecting um, samples of people's work, and Twitter has been fantastic for this because somebody would post something and I go, "Oh my God, that's an amazing way of you did lighting on this," and I'll just save it. Mm -hmm. And I've got a bucket of, and they're not sorted and they're not organized. Um, I've got a couple hundred megs, maybe a couple of gigs of just you know little tiny JPEGs of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'll just flick through them. I'll just flick through them, flick through them, flick through them. And when you see something, um, like I showed you guys earlier, uh, I, I didn't need another and these wasn't here, so I'll have to show it to him when we're after, after we finish, um, because mm. the game the guy and guy hasn't seen the game, so I don't want to show it to anybody else. <laughs> but um, you just see something, you go, that's that's it right there. That's the look I want. Mm. And can I get more source material that gives me ideas to sort of develop that? Ad? How does it flow? How does it work? Mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, I'd, I'd I don't know for you, but it's it's. Uh, don't you have the, the impression that sometimes the, the the final result is not necessarily from things that you discover, but also from from past impression, you know, from from yeah. memory. Yes, I mean, yeah. it's, uh, well, you, I, yeah, you, you think about what you think, you know. Like Fred, I did you the gas prom, 
right? Yeah. Um, I did. It was for you, wasn't it? Gazprom. No. Yeah. No. So okay, somebody else asked me for Gazprom. Oh yes, that was yeah, me. Yeah, it, yeah, it was. Yeah. It's, it's not Gazprom. It's uh, August. Yeah. No, I, I, well, I was saying Gazprom because that's what they call it now. Yeah, yeah. Um, August, and I was thinking, the IT what network. What does look like? Yeah. And then I found some Soviet posters, and they didn't quite look like the way I remember them. Exactly. But how, how does it feel? What's the feel I get off mm. off, off, off uh, a, mm. a, a, a Soviet era poster? And you'd be surprised very quickly how you realize, in fact, you're you're not thinking about Soviet era poster. You're thinking about you know, say, 1930s um, mm. European socialist or I don't mean national fascist. I mean, sort of like the communists. Or you're thinking about America back to work 1930s um, great plan stuff. Because they're all, they're all influencing each other, and you realize that you've merged it all into a blob in your head. Mm. You kind of you, you take a few samples just to kind of refresh yourself, and you start yeah. diving in. How are they dealing with faces? How are they dealing with lines? How are they dealing with lighting? And it sort of becomes this sort of amalgam. And then I, through that process, I think you tend to also sort of strip out the things about that period that you don't like in their style, and you come up with something that is referencing them. But you're also it also allows you in some ways a certain amount of leverage. To use, um, like I did one for a uh, Holland Spiel for the vote, and they wanted this sort of like the old, the old nineteenth century spiral track score track. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, but I think, but then, but the period for the the, the spiral ends right about the time that the suffragists starts, or the eighteen fifty. That's when you start seeing it. But people, you're, you're you're getting a it's old world, it's nineteenth century. You think of the things that are actually older than they are. People think exactly. of seventies design. A lot of seventies design is actually from the sixties. What they're thinking of is 80s design or early mm -hmm. 80s design that's been developed out of some of the ideas in the 70s. So you're mm -hmm. playing with those ideas and what are the pieces that in, um, the people power one, right? The cheesy font I used is so yeah. 80s. It's like that's burning 80s. Um, what I put it on, you know, at that, but because they wanted an 80s look for it because that's when, you know, the period we're talking about. So you start mm -hmm. trying to find those little components, those little blocks that are sort of memory aids to people to think about a certain time and place. And that helps you then, and again, and that sort of like tricks we're using to sort of then I can make this beautiful, I can build a picture around it and I can take liberties in other places, which I do with, mm -hmm. in several places in Red Flag or Paris, historically and whatever, because there's enough stuff in there that makes that, that triggers people sort of subconscious to go, you know, 1870. So you actually rely on 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 already existing assumption within the player. So you think yes. that for a design to be effective, it has mm. to trigger something that they know. Or if I'm doing a sci-fi map, that's not going to help me unless yeah. I'm doing a '60s style. So, so you know what I mean. So if mm. I'm trying to get a little, that's part of building sort of the carrot, the, the story and the narrative is to have a reaction. If um, if I'm going to put a 1930s map for an 1840s mm. setting. I better have a damn good reason why I'm doing that. It's got to be so much more beautiful as so people will forgive me. And of course, historians are not going to forgive me for that kind of blatant step out of field. I'm, I, like I'm doing a map, map for Holland Spiel right now, and it's a train game, right? And all the train games are 18th or 19th century. Well, I did this one kind of 1930s because I didn't want to have, and I had a couple of things that were just, I saw the images and I went, that's the style I want. That's what I want to do. And they bought into it. And something mm -hmm. I will say about the gaming community and, and, and board game companies is they are very open to being free with, uh, I'm thinking, um, you know, with um, those um, Northeast, um, the Indian world. I don't know the Northeast. Yeah, so. when, when, I, when, I, when I saw them the first time, I went. Because I, I, for years, I thought, this, like, we got to do something else with hexes. And then you do that, and I, had, I just sit down, I leave the room because it's like, mm. ah! <laughs> and it just, but it's the perfect place. I think, you know, if you did a D Day game with that, I'm not sure it would work, but it just, it would just brought everything together the theme, the period, mm. the atmosphere. And then the style was very consistent. And it's a, again, sort of, a, I think, 30s, um, you know, at, or like, or like the, um, the, 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 the chart you have on um, Black Hill, the Pacific yes. one. You know, it's uh, you said last week that we, the, the, the charts were the more important and playing the game, they are really important. But yeah. you took such a different look at them. I'm used to having this sort of like, oh, chart here, blah, 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 blah. you know, what, what, you know, it's a WordPress, uh, it's a you know, word table with stuff in. Hmm. How do we break that out to make people think about because that's what it's, I think some ways we try and I think I try and do with, with some of the design is. Make it easy enough they understand, but also make it uncomfortable enough and different enough they have to think a little bit about it. Now, hopefully, that helps yes. them not fall into a trap of thinking about the game being something that it isn't. 
Mm. You know what I mean? That actually is the perfect transition to another question I had for you guys is what do you think is the role of graphics in a war game? What do you think it plays in the in the mind of the player? What do you think it's it brings? What, what do you think it needs to trigger? What's the and like if you're thinking about what your role is, what you're trying to achieve, what what, what we would you say? And I'm, Niels, you had you had a weird reaction, so I'm going to ask you specifically. Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, it's um, I don't know. I think I will I will answer after. I need to think about this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Even yeah, you want to uh, our role, yeah. our role in wargaming as a designer. So, so that was the question, more or less. Yeah, as a graphic designer, what do you think in the design? What's what's your role? Like, uh, is it is it to to make the story more compelling? Is it to make it more immersive? Is it also to say something about the history in a more visual manner? What do you think is making it playable? <laughs> yeah, yes, making it playable. <laughs> <laughs> making it playable, making it make the games, the war games, pretty. Because war games, uh, you know, always had uh, uh, like a lower design standard, I think. No? Graphic design standard. There was, uh, of course, uh, big names in, in war game design, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't um, in the war game history. It, it, Design what graphic design was the, the first uh, and the priority, you know, of the of the of the player. It, it looked like the the war gamer wasn't looking for graphic design or it wasn't moving enough money to to attract. Even if, uh, for example, uh, victory games. Uh, graphic style was superb and very super professional uh, graphic style. Gorgeous stuff. Uh, the overall look of the war game, uh, I th I think it it lacked uh, mm, uh, some kind of professionality. Uh, except uh, except those big uh, publishers. Um, now mm, we gotta get the pace of the uh, board gaming industry and um, get into the graphic quality standard. Even if we are a niche, a small niche, I think we we got uh, we gotta do an effort to to get in, into more people. And I think uh, the graphic design is one one of the main elements we gotta improve to to make work more work games more popular. That's actually an interesting point that 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 uh, graphic design is also a, a a tool for for approachability. I saw some quite a lot of reaction about the the battles of the old Northwest uh, series and the graphic design for it. Like I think it's mm -hmm. something that like touched a lot of people and personally it was one of the i think it's i think we, that this is when Niels became a, a a person in my mind it's like when i saw this and i was wondering who's doing those 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 graphics uh oh and that's the that's the comment and and i was actually wondering about this so for the people who don't know that's a series by high flying dice so it's a it's a ziplock game that it, and it's uh it's what is it? Is it 17th and 18th 18th century uh, battles in the in in North America? It's uh, crossing crossing over both centuries. Yes. Yes. Have, crossing uh, over the both. Yes. And graphically and, uh, super compelling. And when I saw it, the thing that I thought about was Hugo Pratt. I don't know why, but there was something like about exactly. yes. And I was like, and, 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 and I was thinking about Don. And I think that why it triggered me and why I thought it was so beautiful is that it reminded me of. My experience reading uh, some Hugo Bratt cubing po po uh, comic books, and I was like, I didn't expect Hugo having a to think about Hugo Pratt while playing a war game, and and that was mm -hmm. something that was really strong for me. And I was wondering, is mm -hmm. this something that was um, uh, voluntary, or is it was a absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, immersion. I'm, I'm of course I'm looking for immersion. It's that my main uh, criteria. And um, and even was mentioning something about you know the the, the, the graphic standards in the industry and uh, mm -hmm. and it's true that um, coming from a U European perspective we didn't have uh, um, a Redmond uh, Simonson for example 
we didn't have this unifying graphic system and for very very long we had to rely on other systems or other sources of inspiration for example mm -hmm. so for the battles of the old, old uh, northwest is coming from uh, something specific to uh, france i think probably uh, sort of france and europe uh, probably which is a graphic novel or the, the comic book form you know which uh, dedicated they, they were like these dedicated magazines in the 80s 90s called Metal Hurlant, uh, yes. Vécu, à suivre. And uh, they were, they, they, these magazines were like major vehicles for innovative storytelling, especially for historical storytelling. You know? So mm -hmm. part of my uh, formative years in, in graphics comes from also reading all these uh, uh, magazine. And, uh, and it, it's difficult to, uh, I think this, um, it's uh, you can never you can never highlight enough the influence of uh, someone like Hugo Pratt, uh, Jean Giraud, uh, Tardy, for example, uh, François Bourgeon, in the counterculture in the eighties in in, uh, in Europe, for example. So uh, when I approached this series, I wanted something. Uh, I'm I'm always drawing from memory, and I keep remember uh, I kept remembering about uh, um, a book called. A wheeling from Hugo Pratt, uh, Fort Wheeling, which was exactly that period, you know, and uh, and I thought that uh, it would be an interesting uh, way to bring in, uh, bring back colors, strong colors into the uh, into war games, and to try to and to try to provide maybe new new connections in the in the minds of players, because of course this is obviously French or European. So, but I wanted to see if other people could relate to this, you know, if other people could see uh, the 18th century or, or, or they, could, they could feel, you know, the wind or in, in, in the woods in, in, you know, on my maps, for example, if it's something that I could translate even to players from other, to, from other cultures or other backgrounds. Mm -hmm. That actually makes me think because from what I've heard is that it's funny because I I think I had some expectations about uh, about your working process. I expected you and you you talked about it doing a lot of research and everything. But then I realized talking with you guys how subjective it is, and how the fact that I react to specific art is actually linked to my own personal experiences and everything. Uh, and I'm and I'm wondering, do you think that you, the three of you, being your European? actually makes it so that the the way that you approach uh, uh work when it comes to graphic design like brings something different to uh to uh to to humor your uh, american uh, graphic designers well you're, you're looking for a different angle i mean i don't know for maybe i'm speaking for myself but i'm always looking for a new approach something again i i i played a lot before and uh, i have a pretty good idea what uh, everything that happened in the in terms of graphics for war games between uh, 1980 and today. And you're always looking for, for a new experience. You're always looking for a different angle, a different way of relating to uh, a period. So I would specifically try to uh, uh, destructure the, the game or decompose the game entirely and try to rebuild it from inside out. You know, it's, uh, I'm more influenced by the uh, experimentation of uh, Dutch graphic design, for example. So I wouldn't hesitate to rethink, uh, rethink even uh, hexes, the hex grid, the purpose of everything. I would, uh, I would really spend a lot of time trying to see if there would be a, a different way, maybe a new way, or a different approach to uh, to representing um, to represent a war game. And is it you know, the, excuse me, it, it was a, your proposal on on that map we were talking about. Northwest uh, something of course. Uh, what was the name? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Your proposal of deforming the the axis. It was yours, so it was the designer. You you tweaked the, the designer idea. You proposed to okay. to, to deform no, no, the. Usually, it comes from me. I mean, I said yeah, usually. Uh, mm -hmm. But in this case, it's also touching another subject. So it means mm -hmm. that um, once you start introducing all these colors, once you start introducing uh, cartography into the um, mm -hmm. into your maps, you know, once you start uh, 
moving away from the one hex, one terrain type, you know, we need to find different solutions. And uh, over the years, I started to realize that, for example, my main data la layer was the hex grid. I would try to convey a lot of information with the hex grid. I would put more annotations. I would vary the width, uh, play more with the colors of the, the, the of the hex borders. I would try to uh, raise uh, one level of uh, information, uh, a bit like um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I can make a parallel with the computer, inf you know, the um, HUD interfaces. You know, and you see this in science fiction movies, and you have a layer underneath where you have a terrain highlighted, a hologram, and actually all the information is coming from on a layer above. Mm -hmm. So I realized, for example, that no, it was, it is possible, for example, to use the exact terrain. But of course, it, come with, with, it comes with serious caveats. And one of these caveats is, of course, readability, legibility, and it has to be playable. So one of the solutions, for example, was to transfer a lot of information onto the hex grid and even to develop this point even more. Mm -hmm. I have one game I'm working on one where uh, all the information comes exclusively from the hex grid. So for me, for example, the hex is more than just a hex. It's, uh, it's an, addition, an additional data layer. And it's, um, it's something very, very, very interesting, very important even for the future, because um, if we want to go uh, more towards, uh, if we want, to, uh, for example, the wargaming scene to benefit more from the the, the, the latest developments in, in cartog cartography, for example, we will have to find a different way to represent the information or to use uh, um, the grids, you know. And, and that's actually a really interesting point that you're making because there is a lot of uh, bridges between what you guys are doing and 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 the work that is being done in cartography. And we can see that in the, in cartography with the uh, the improvements of uh, like you have a lot of cartographers that are using more and more uh, computer design and making uh, very compelling graphics uh, of uh, um, representing either the geology or or even um, a political or or abstract layers on top of it. And I'm wondering how how, in, how much you are inspired by cartographers, like professional cartographers. Well, Is it something that yeah. you, that you, that it's you, that, uh, and I, have, sorry, I think, yeah. I think that we, we had both, both Ivan and Dan. So I would no, go no, no, with, no. I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, let's, uh, let's, Nils talk. I'm confused, guys. Yeah, it's now a so, lot about cartography. I, I would, so it's, Don starts, uh, yeah, and, and then oh, we go done, to, and, and yeah, go, go ahead, Don, and I would, then I would, I will give you the, the, okay. the mic, Nils. Yeah, no, I, it's, it, it's, it's, my, it, for me, it goes down to sort of like go back to my, when I, I was an art college, I did fine art print. So mm -hmm. I was doing um, etching and mise en and, and it was all about making marks to represent information. Um, you know, line of cuts because you can't in those in that process you really you don't have you know you're you can't really do color work right so you, everything's broken down to lines and how you make marks and how you um, play with the depth of those marks to have more range so you get richer and, and so you start and cartographers are using print techniques they're using you know you know three color or four color process they're designing with a very very narrow palette they're designing with a very narrow um sort of range for free creativity and they're still able to do absolutely amazing things but mm -hmm. the important thing is and whatever they do has to transfer information it has to be understandable that somebody comes along and goes oh there's the high point there's the low point in a sense almost you know if you take the numbers off and the names off map can you figure out what the fuck is going on on the map pardon my friend mm -hmm. or whatever yeah so if there's you know you you guys say it's so much better than the english um <laughs> It, it, you know, so how do you, you know, so you can't not look at maps because again, again, I was saying earlier about sort of what people have in their heads is that everyone has this huge stockpile of flashcards in their heads because you can only make so many decisions in a day. So your brain creates a flashcard of, oh, it's at that. Okay, here's the flashcard. So I can, I can do a subroutine around it and not use up my brain power because I've got other crap to worry about, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're, what I think for me as a designer, I'm using those flashcards. And if I'm using... If I go to a cartographer, cartographer that people have seen or know or understand or see the style, because they're influenced by the people around them in their periods. I'm looking at a map maker from 1930 because I want a 1930s vibe. 
they have they have got they've done the work for me. They already have the t- my, my my palette and my toolbox made. Is can I do something mm-hmm. a little bit fresher? That's that can tr- can I translate that for today so that they so today looks at that like it was those, but gets across the information that which what you know which is information they didn't have at the time and didn't have to translate. So I'm adding another layer of technical information, and I really like Neil's idea of 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 of, of uh, like more information into the hex grid. Because the hex grid has always been, I've, I've been, unfortunately, I've never had to, I've never had an opportunity to redo hex game, hex counter game. Somebody wants me to do a hex game, I would love to, because I, I want to play with uh, how we how we share information with the hex grid. It's really interesting yeah. because hexes are, are going a bit out of uh, fashion, and I think it's a it's it's too bad because I think that hexes has a lot to offer, and there is a game uh, where uh, but, uh, people are bored because we haven't done much with them. Yeah, but you know, I think yeah. there is actually a lot of stuff to be done, and there is a game that really made me think a lot about this. I don't know if you guys played this. Yes, uh, okay. it's LCK it's awesome. 1918. It's awesome. It's really great. And the thing that I yes. loved about this, apart from the topic and the way it addresses it, is the fact that it subverts your idea of what a hex can do and how a hex can be used within a game. And I was like, thank God someone is showing people that actually a hex is is it, it, like... We, we've been too focused in, into what, SES uh, and, and uh, classic hex encounters. And this reminds us that a hex is just a shape and you can play around with it and you can say a lot of things. Exactly. And it has, a, it has a massive amount of, uh, of, of power. You can do a lot of things with it. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, we'll give the, the, yeah, one of you, when I, I, I'll get this back. But I think, yeah, hexes, has, I just want to have your opinion on hexes. Yeah, someone just jumped in. Okay. Lovely cover too. <laughs> they're 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 a tool, you know. It's just we have to use them in new and interesting mm-hmm. ways. You know, you can't do some completely new. You have to sort of build on existence because you don't want mm-hmm. to force them too much intellectual overhead. And that's sort of the advantage of using metaphors and ideas and the, and sort of sort of biases and flashcards that people already have is that you don't then have to explain that narrative. They insert it for you, and then the bit you want them that's new to, to learn whatever it would be in terms of how you're treating the hexes or whatever. That's the new thing on the, in the map that they're mm-hmm. learning and engaging with. Um, I, I think SVI did wonders for the hobby in many ways, but it also put us in a stranglehold of we play hexes. Well, and we, put hex, we think of hexes as blocks of color. Mm. And that, you know, and the, 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 the color does height. That's, that's what hexes mm-hmm. do and it regulates movement. Go ahead, Niels. You were about to say something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, mean, I mean, over the years, what strikes me uh, more and more is uh, maybe uh, this connection. This connection between, you know, the, you know, the, the, the intricate layers of meaning, of content in any in simulation, the expectation in terms of uh, gaming experience, of learning experience, and, uh, and the translation uh, even today into a relatively not stunted, but you know, a relatively conventional uh, form, for example. Uh, Donald was mentioning about the 70s, but you, uh, this is a very, very good point. I mean, in the 70s, I mean, this is uh, my uh, opinion, of course, but SPI maps and counters were actually ahead mm-hmm. of uh, the available historical material. It means that it gave uh, players the opportunity to uh, not only to play out events on improved maps, uh, versus the average, you know, um, uh, diagram and sketches that you could find in the books, but you could also uh, visualize better uh, the effects on terrain, on movements, on combat. You know, it it was it was groundbreaking. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you go fast forward to to, to 2020, uh, to, uh, to 2021, it seems like, uh, and I know it's a loaded, uh, very sensitive question, but it seems like that our simulation have not benefited benefited uh, in the same way from the developments in cartography or even data visualization, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, access to terrain data has never been as simple, and yet, whenever we, whenever I see uh, a new design, we still. We still uh, divert rivers. We reshape mountains to fix the hex uh, to, to to fit a hex grid, for example. It would be uh, one of the questions, for example, I will have would be, uh, what would we need today to uh, to benefit from all these new uh, techniques or these new approaches, visual approaches, and and still keeping the the playability and readability that we are used to. 
It's a very loaded question. I, 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 I know that it's a very sensitive and it's... Uh, it's an interesting you try, question. You can try push that narrative on, a, on any uh, constant world forum and you know what's going to happen. You know, so. <laughs> Sorry. But if we don't push those conversations, then we're just going to have... And I, I think it was kind of what happened in, in many ways in the 80s is that they settled into SPI and then there was yeah. one line that was doing ASL. So complexity was the solution. Um, you know, Functionality and, and complexity. You know, yeah. Occasionally yeah. something like drag, it would drag and pass would come out and like, you know, and it would be glorious color and, you know, and rich and fun of narrative, but it was still hexes, 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 hexes. We, I, we just, we haven't made the, there's, there's a sort of, in a, you know, it's like the movement to CG, uh, care driven games or, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the asymm asymmetry or something like coin. We, somebody is going to go, what if we, and it'll change everything about how we do it because it's, it, 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 it begs that we can do something more with it. The problem is you can't do something completely transformative because I think it becomes too much intellectual capital for the sort of person to maintain in their head too much sort of, sort of like intellectual overhead. So it's gotta be, sort of, you know, the way we've sort of advanced the, the sort of the design and the hobby is sort of incrementally. And every now and again, we haven't done anything huge because I think anything anything that get, goes really huge really becomes a struggle for people to make that leap with you. Mm. And I think maybe the jump in, in hexes may be too big a leap or we're not quite close enough to make that next leap. Hmm. But these things I'd, like more, I know. I'd, I'd like to hear from you, Ivan. Yes, what do you think? Do you also think that we're on the, that there is another leap that we need to go through that we've been too, too much focusing on, on what was done in the past, do you think there is something that is just ahead that we, that you as graphic yeah, designer should be working you know, on? I think we got a, a lot of a lot to learn from other type of games like Euro games or and, 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 yeah, all the, all the game blooming that is going around. Um, just we got a lot of information available from from those things that. Uh, that we could just use. I, I don't think uh, wargaming is, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, stuck in terms of design when that we have, uh, you know, innovative designs. You, I, I don't know if you were talking in terms of graphic design or design or game design in general. Uh, but uh, wargaming, I think, is, is moving ahead. Uh, we can grab the inspiration from so many sources. Uh, for example, new new cartography, uh, uh, new types of game, uh, new ways of thinking of conflicts, historical events. Uh, um, it would be great if we got a big leap, uh, but uh, as you said, I think and it's going to be gradual. Gradual, you no, know, as you said, not no, you know, big trust uh, ahead. Uh, usually, get people confused and we stand in the. Giant shoulders, as, as they say. I, 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 that makes me wonder if, in a sense, we're as designers waiting for the game designer to come up with something that demands us to do mm -hmm. that, to sort of push it up, to do mm -hmm. something, you know? Because um, usually I, I, I find myself responding, okay, the designer's trying to do this. I need to understand what the designer's trying to do. How do I support their vision? How do I mm -hmm. make their vision spread out? And if their vision's not asking me to do something innovative with hexes, then mm -hmm. I'm not going to. You know, unless I happen to see, oh, that looks pretty if I do that. It be it becomes, you know, you can't do everything. So what are the pieces I can put aside and simplify to do the one thing that I, that I give it, you know, that gets me excited about it. And so I, I think that's that that gives a good transition because that's also something that I would like to to pick your brain on maybe as a conclusion because we were at one hour fifteen. The time went really fast. I didn't expect it. I think it was really good, but. I think it's a it's a good point that you're raising, Don, about maybe uh, also the design themselves actually challenging you as a graphic designer to to actually force you to 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 work on on new approaches and everything. And I'm going to bring back a question from Sean uh, that was that that he asked a, a while ago, but I think it was is a good conclusion to also a question that I wanted to ask is I would like to ask each of you as graphic designer, 
what are the war games recently that inspired you the most and were you were you felt like it was actually challenging the old assumptions and everything so maybe give you can have one two or three that's fine three maximum because we're going to try to finish this in, in, in 15 minutes so let's start with you niels um uh in 2010 when i uh, when i went back into war gaming much hasn't had, hadn't changed you know it was more or less the same hexes like mm -hmm. this but one game caught my eye and it was uh, um, napoleon's uh, triumph uh, rachel Simon, uh, mm -hmm. simmons and that game in 2010 or 2009 i don't remember when it came out yes this is what you call in french in claque it means oui. it was oui. uh, oui. violent, it, like, huh? yeah it, it was really uh, challenging and and, and it, it was stimulating it was uh, i thought that, okay something is possible there's uh, we can really combine uh, visual uh, graphics uh, interesting ideas uh, mechanics it's uh, it was my uh, it's my reference uh, i mean it's it, my reference it's uh, one of the games that really uh, left uh, an imprint on uh, on uh, in my mind and okay. recently apart from napoleon's triumph is there anything because like uh, i don't know if anything <clears throat> else no and it's fine you can say that apart from rachel simmons nothing is inspiring you and that's okay no 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 it's uh, no no i mean it's, uh, I, I i saw a lot of uh, interesting uh, things coming up but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's just to give names or not but uh, and, and you, and I'm, I'm, I'm expecting a lot from uh, the troubles and uh, and from Ivan's uh, Almoverida. So, Almoverida, Almoverida, yeah, Almoverida. Yeah, I, I, I was sitting, I was sitting, hoping you'd come to me last because, like, I, I absolutely Napoleon's triumph, like, just. I mean, as a graphics, I was like, oh my god. I mean, and this is something I think that, that I, I suspect other people here do. There are games I buy purely because Murray Wars is one one because it it, it, acts, it also turns out to be a beautiful game, a good great game to play. But there's something about it that aesthetically is very pleasing to me. There's other board mm -hmm. games like Euro Games is one that I would buy, and I know I'll never play. But there's they're they're packaged, they're designed, they are just just a I re I'm recognizing a, there's a designer and engineer. There's somebody with vision. There's a group here that really put together something that's special. I have no idea how good the game is. It may not be a game. It may be a great game. I may never play it. That's not why I'm buying it. I'm buying it because it's an inspiration to me. Um, so, and I, in, in terms of naming specific games, I mean, you know, coin games, and this is not necessarily as an aesthetic one, but it is, it, 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 um, it's asymmetry is now something that you can think about. Mm. Right? Hex encounters don't do asymmetry very well unless you've got ludicrously complicated sort of conditional sub rules and all kinds of crap. And then there's this. Um, things like War of the Ring. I love that. I think that was just how big can we go? Can we do Euro Trash but, but rich and deep and complex? Um, that is the book, you know? Um, like, I, 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 I really love Dune Imperium as a game. It's not mm. Dune to me. It doesn't. It's not the book. It's it's not the original. The, the the old Dune is the game to me because it's complicated. It's in, you know. Yeah, I agree. What's happening and so it's yeah. it's it, it, it's it's games that sort of turn things on their heads. I don't know if we know what they are right now, because we'll know in ten years time, because no one else has taken up um, the, the the sort of the the, the Napoleon's Triumph challenge, you know. I mean, Gettys the, the the Gettysburg one she did. It's I'm, oh my god. But did, 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 as a designer, do you know how hard it is to come up with something like this? Yeah. Like, really, hey. this is, you know, <laughs> you no know, how to make your you guys stop. Right. Like, uh, come on, yeah, like, Rachel's like, insane. Like, it's yeah. it's unreachable that level. Like, it's yeah. uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's stop um, putting pressure on us. Like, we're doing what we can. Okay, we're doing what we can. Please. We want to make it look gorgeous. How's that? There's a deal for you. We will make yeah. it look gorgeous. You just need to do it. No, um, it, it's uh, it's trends that more interesting to me. There's a trend towards more elegant, and I think I think Coin is a good example in war yeah. war games. There's there's still a lot of hex encounters coming out with like 75 numbers on the on the on the counter, uh, hex encounter, and it's you know there's terrain charts and the CRTs and all the rest of it. And there's a place for that, but it's the innovative stuff that gets me really excited. Mm -hmm. um, or you know, and sometimes like innovative design. I mentioned um, there's. 
I mean, I have to go into my basement and look at my wall of games and go, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. <laughs> you know? And actually, so even doing that later on, he was looking back at his shelf, mm -hmm. looking in, in, in all yeah, of yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> So even what, 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 you know, what, what is getting you? Or, yeah. One, one game I, I love, I, I, it looked so nice, is the one you showed, the Helsinki 19... 1918, yes. yeah. Yeah, 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 it was nice. I hope uh, they do more games. I games. They, 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 yeah, they, so they did the uh, W18. W. Yeah, exactly. Uh, W1815, which was also very nice package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so nice. yeah. this one is very nice, and they're working yeah. right now on a on a tactical Napoleonic game that uses hexes in a very interesting way with counters that can pivot. So it's it's actually pretty fun. Like, but I think it's going to be in a few years. If they it takes a lot of time, but this time there is something. It's a bit, uh, it's very innovative. So yeah, definitely yeah. UNP games go. Yeah, super interesting uh, publisher. Yeah. Not two more games I gotta buy. This wasn't supposed to cost me money, you know. Oh yeah, and those ones <laughs> can get super expensive because it's short print runs. So you yeah, have to yeah, buy yeah. from hoarders. So yeah, horrible. Yeah. Get... Um, another another um, another designer I love all the things. Uh, it does is Olivier Revenu. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Olivier Revenu, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Battles magazine, yeah, yeah. Battles sure. magazine is uh, yeah. sure. He lays out uh, like no one does. Lay, lays out text and um, it's it's lovely. Um, 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 you know the map uh, of Maori Wars just shocked me when I saw it. It was like discovering a mystery, and, and <laughs> I wanted to dig into that. I for the little uh, for the little story, even the map was done in 2013. Yeah, the game came out in 2018, but the map was done in two months in 2013. Mm -hmm. <laughs> After it was just like five years of development, you know. So yeah, yeah. it, it was just like a, a spur of the moment thing. And uh, uh, Randy Line over at War Legion War Games kept uh, kept mentioning about this project, about the Maori uh, Maori Wars, and uh, yeah, they just triggered uh, so many ideas. And uh, and I wanted to play mm -hmm. with fonts. And and in 2013, the full period map where you actually uh, emphasize your typography and mm -hmm. uh, in the engra in engraving lines on the map, you know, at that time, it was still difficult. I, I keep, I keep, I, um, I keep uh, remember, remembering you showing this on, on Consim World, you know, all the mistakes I made. And, uh, and it wasn't obvious at all. The, the engraving lines were, were in the way of functionality. It was the whole map was, uh, mm -hmm. it was, uh, it almost broke me because it was really difficult to get to get through or certain people, you know, so it was really difficult. But anyway, for even the, the story was that it was done quickly. Uh, it was really like a, a gestation, you know, like, was like a, something that I wanted to get out of my system. And, uh, and then it stayed five years in development, which, which happens, of course, but wow. for good reasons, but. Uh, <clears throat> I think it was uh, like game breaking, that, that kind of map. He, for me, it was uh, so influential. Thank you. And, uh, and that's it. Good. But I think it's. So we're at 125. So we're really getting close to the end. Uh, so I think we are going to close it with this, with a bit of love from, from Ivan to Niels. And I think it's a, it's a nice touch. It's, a, it's, mm -hmm. it's very nice to see. So if you're just coming in and you're watching it this live, just for you to know the games that you need to buy is uh, Santa Cruz uh, 1797. You need oh. to buy Maori Wars. You need to buy Red Flag over Paris, obviously, because that's obviously you need to buy this. Too and then you. And then you need to buy Helsinki 1919 and maybe W1815 if you can get a copy of it. That's what you need to buy, that's for sure. And if you still have a bit of money, maybe get this one. This one is really cool, very beautiful, and actually it's super mm -hmm. fun. It's a very tight game. I love it. That one too. Oh, yes. Oh, God, you are in advance, but that's uh, that was great. So I would just finish uh, by saying, first of all, to the three of you, thank you very much for being here tonight. And for the people who are following the show, uh, I just want to make a quick announcement around Book Club, uh, the Wargame Book Club. So 
Uh, the first episode worked really well, so we're going to do episode two. Uh, there were some votes uh, about what should be book number two, and what was voted in was When Titans Clashed. So that's going to be book number two for the Wargame Book Club. Mm, uh, and I will yes. announce the show. Um, it would probably be uh, second half of June, but I will give more information on Twitter and on Board Game Geek. So um, follow it there. But uh, yeah, so just if you want to know and if you want to follow the uh, Wargame Book Club, get this book, and we're going to talk about it next month. It was an awesome discussion, guys. That was really, really cool. Uh, it made me want to buy more games. Uh, so that's going to be a discussion that I'm going to have with my wife after this show about uh, how can we make room somewhere in the apartment so I can get more stuff. Uh, but it was it was really cool. So I wanted to thank all of you. Um, thank you. And actually, I wanted to talk about stuff that you're doing right now. But I guess that's I would give you just each of you maybe a 30 second, one minute just to, to say goodbye and maybe talk about something that you're working on right now that you're really excited about. And uh, and I think that we're that would be okay. it. And I'll start uh, clockwise order. So back to how we did on number one. And I'll start with you, Niels, because you feel very uncomfortable. And I want to start with you because that sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I'm working on a lot of games, uh, six or seven. Um, but wow. uh, there's one game in particular which uh, I'm, uh, I'm really happy about. And it's a game happening in 1944. And in 1944, there's uh, just uh, two major operations, and uh, one is in the east and one is in the west. And I'm working on something in the west. And that's all I can say. Okay, that's good enough. <laughs> Thanks, Niels. <laughs> Done. Uh, I'm working on one that's about sieges, and I can't say any more than that because Fred put, Fred knows what it is. I showed him something earlier on. I now, if people it. are following me on Twitter, they know sieges. I've been very enthusiastic about a specific designer that made a couple of games for Hollenspiel that is working on a new game about a siege that happens in Central Europe in 17th century, so something like this. Yep. Yep, yes. that, that could very well be. Very <laughs> that, that could be oh. it. That could be it. Oh, Let's see. Um, um, uh, so Neil, so your, your, your your Spanish maps thing, uh, the, the military one. There's some you know, just yeah, yeah exactly. Afterwards, I'll show it. Exactly. Uh, I'll show you what they were doing after. Remember the, um, the remember the map from uh, SPI game, the um, Art of Siege. Yes, There's one about Lille, Lille, yes. which is wonderful. They're just making us feel old. Um, yeah, <laughs> that was yes, that was fantastic. Um, yeah. So um, I'm doing something for Hollenspiel. It's a train game, which is a new one for me. I'm kind of excited about that one. Um, that's the one that's going to be in the 30s, not in the, the 1830s, so 1930s. Um, I'm working on Troubles. That was a similar thing to, to, to Fred's Red Flag. I offered to help out with it because I just got excited about it. And I did that because I'm an Irish person, and it's something that I grew up around, and it was something that I think needed to get further along to get people excited with. So that's going to be coming out Compass Games, hopefully at the end of the year. Um, we're still making changes. Um, yeah, and, and just one thing about this. So, there's so many levers on that game, I can't even tell yeah, you. And, and that's the thing. I, I, I've read your post about it, and there is something that made me uh, excited about the game is is the way you approach uh, civilian casualties. And I think it's like the the fact that you thought about it, about how to represent it in the game, and 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 talk about the weight of that conflict and and what it involves is is super. It was super interesting to read uh, your thoughts on it and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. I have some reservations about the game because it looks like there maybe are too many levers on it. But that's there, another. I, yeah, and I, I, I think it's it's going to challenge. I mean, it's not a coin system because it's not been done by GMT, but it, it's yeah. I mean, it isn't. Um, I think it'll it's certainly challenging how much the system can take. Um, but I think um, there are like there's a whole there's like nine scenarios. One of them is like six cards long. So there's something in there that you can at least figure it out and see if it's really and it's six players as well, which is you know a challenge for that. On the other end, I just finished doing some some, some something. Who's doing something on a zombie coin game? Um, yeah, to help him, yeah, to, to, to help him sort of pitch that to to to, to somebody or to GMT hopefully. Um, what else? There's there's um, I'm doing there's another there's an expansion for Fields of Fire. Yeah. With that's that's a funny kind of design. So that's a situation. I, I, it might have been nice if we got got to talking about art direction. And sort of the you know the the, the the game designer wanted very specifically not to have certain things, which are exactly the things I was going to go to. So <laughs> of design, design around the things that would have been certain, some ways the best solution for the problem, which was kind of fun. Mm. Um, there's so I'm putting up the bit back for that, and uh, there's something else. Again, you know, like that. This I got three or four things. Oh, and Mr. President for GMT. 
Yeah, yeah, but this one has been in the works for years. Yeah, yeah. Don't mention it, don't come on. The, it's ma like... the maps, the charts are all done and paid for, so they're going to have to actually, you know, right now it's fine-tuning the rules. My yeah. theory is that this game doesn't exist. I think it's, <laughs> it's like, that's my theory, and, uh, and I stand by it. And maybe uh, as soon as I say this, Gene will pull off the plug on, on, on uh, just a Robin Hood because I say this. Yeah, you know, about it. He's, he's paying for it, so it's going to happen. No, they've, they've decided to stop adding presidents. <laughs> which is which helps you know yes, yeah, um, i guess that helps at some point you need to stop somewhere yeah yeah so there's like five there's five counter sheets there's uh wow. two and a half maps what's well, so one and a half maps a couple five extra counter sheets, sheets. Yeah. Five, yeah yeah but how many how many oh, counter yeah. trades you need for this seven cards I oh think. god but i don't want to talk about it shut up don it makes me it's, makes it's, me it's sad. going to yeah. eat, it's going to eat your life but i mean there's so it's one of those things i think is going to be You'll want to play a couple of them just to see how. Why I mean, that's the thing. Games. That's the worst part is that as soon as it's released, I'm gonna buy it because I'm a moron. You're gonna need this a big because game. it looks awesome. It looks awesome. You're gonna need but a I want to convince game. myself that it doesn't exist. For now, it doesn't uh, and, exist. And then the last one I'm working on is Charioteer, for, which is. Um, oh, you're working on this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, that, that's that's sort of 99 done. Yeah, it's this one I P I P five hundred it straight away uh, because yeah, Sekigara and I was like, oh, a racing game, yeah. and I was like, and it looks amazing, and I was like, yeah, definitely it, it, take my blocks, money. It's blocks and it's simple and it's so. I mean, in a lot of ways, right now, half of what I'm doing isn't board games at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and you, Ivan, what are what are you working on right now? I should be working on Tanto Monta. Yeah. You know the should be working. <laughs> yeah, should, but... <laughs> He's actually not working on it. But technically, technically, I'm working on it. Yes. <laughs> no, but uh, I had to do the cover for Almoravid, which um... <laughs> he's not here anymore. He actually left, so you can say all the bad stuff you want ah, about yeah, Logo. Yeah. It's fine. It's he fine. actually can... gave me permission to show the the cover, which I oh go ahead, go ahead. So it's song, yeah. the cover for Almoravid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one has seen it. Except Volko. <laughs> and he's oh, not here. It's good. And I'm going to add it to the stream. And here it is. Oh, God. Can you zoom oh, in? Ah, lovely. It is, it is the, the whole box, you know? Oh, my God. Yeah. It's nice. almost done, but it's work in progress, you know? Here is Toledo. Yeah. Uh, on the medieval times. And here is uh, an Almoravid warrior. Actually, the the reconquer uh, uh, of Toledo from the Muslims uh, is the thing that started the topic of the game. The the Almoravid intervention in Spain. So we thought it would be nice to put Toledo on the on the cover, and the the lion of the of the kingdom of of Leon. And you know, a uh, uh, logistic uh, element with yes. the meal car. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. So, and, and I actually tried to convince Volko to come up with a, a special rules for man eating mules. So using <laughs> <laughs> using mules as units, he doesn't want it. He doesn't listen. I think it would add so much to the game that you actually. But Volko is yeah. not very. Uh, hey, you know, hey, he like... got very touchy when I was going to put Elvis in the game. All right, so back <laughs> up by judging. Right. Well, no. So here it is. That's really cool. Marvelous. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, and I'm and I must say I'm very excited by this game. I had a lot of fun with uh, Nevsky. I'm actually uh, starting a campaign next week with uh, Joe Dewhurst, uh, the designer of the Pure Land, uh, and we're going to do after action reviews of it. It's going to be a lot of fun. And Almoravid is definitely something I'm looking forward to, mm -hmm. uh, yes. because uh, Nora Putitsa, Rasputitsa sounds like a lot of fun because, <laughs> like the the whole the whole yeah, the whole operational problems of uh, of uh, medieval Russia is uh, is a massive pain in the ass, but also makes it a lot of fun. But I'm really looking forward to see the um, the system in a in a in a warmer climate. And mm -hmm. and it, it, it actually about this, and just maybe as a closing question, it looks like. Everything that I've seen on, on Almoravid, when it comes to the influences that you had, I saw a lot of stuff where it actually reminded me from uh, actually medieval time art, um, uh, but also some of it gave me a strong feeling of like actually comic books and stuff like this. And I, wanted, I was wondering what kind of influence you had for Almoravid. 
Uh, excuse me. <laughs> <What's>... <laughs> <laughs> you were, you, uh, Ivan was just amazed by his own work. Like, <laughs> lost, lost his own cover, not listening to anything. No, Ooh. no, no. Excuse me. Review the question. Excuse me. No, I was you wondering what something on the cover. Like a yeah, I was, <laughs> I was wondering about your influences for Almoravid because I, I saw different yeah. uh, I saw different influences. Some of them that actually looked really like medieval art, uh, so art yeah. from the period, but mm -hmm. some of it actually looked really like comic book uh, inspiration. And I was wondering what kind of influences you had for Almoravid. Yeah, and this game was like a kind of a struggle because it was um, um, so many art that's implicated. Uh, I usually. Mm, I'm in charge of the whole product, and this game was like, and at first I was in charge of some of the cards, and then could you do this, this uh, screens also, and then we like that. Could you do this also, and then I took over the, almost the whole game. Uh, I, that, so that just very quickly, those questions raised by Valko very early on. He talked about sort yes, of uh, I'm going to bring it up. Designer about sort of like where it's it's good to have sort of one artist working on something uh, versus mm -hmm. like you know do you want the whole package? I mean I I you know I came up through the industry, so I mean I'm used to sort of being art directed by an art director. So if you've got you need to have somebody who's got a vision, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, at the, we're at the point sort of like we have the sort of skills to sort of do all the components, but even if you're just you're, you're doling it out, you need somebody with very clear, strong vision. Yeah. yeah. What you're trying to agree. Do. I agree. <laughs> yeah. When I, in, like, in this project, we didn't. Well, you know. <laughs> in this project, we didn't have. Uh, uh, when I when I get into the project, the month was almost done, and the the cover artist was on his way without uh, any communication within uh, between us. So. Um, I came up with my own ideas, which wasn't necessarily the the ideas of the of the team. No, they had uh, initially, and uh, they thought they were good with uh, some realistic style, medieval style. But then I stuck uh, in my research process. I came across these uh, medieval manuscripts, and I fell in love with the style. So I wanted to use that style, or at least uh, imitate uh, it a bit, and use it on the on the on the game, and it came out nice. I think it it yes. gave it a kind of fresh style, not the usual. Uh, romantic uh, kind of illustration. Yeah, you, you did a wonderful job. I sort of capturing stuff I've seen, capturing that that, that medieval, particularly the Spanish style. I, I spent yeah. a lot of art school writing papers on medieval manuscripts, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, particularly <laughs> Irish ones, but sort of like what was going on across Europe and sort of what. And there's a sort of there, there is almost a cartoon comic book vibe to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you start getting into sort of the book of years and the book of dates and all that kind of stuff, you get the, the um, but yeah, you absolutely you, you. There's a way you you caught the essence of them, and then gave it a little bit of flair to it. I just like I really love it. Hmm. Like, it's, it's, it's it's one of those games that I'm, I'm going to buy regardless of whether it's good or not. <laughs> it's going to be good. Gonna be good. Game, it's going to be good. It, uh, the system is great. I think the topic is perfect for the yeah. system, so it's going to be awesome. And I think we're going to close it on this. Both of you giving love to Ivan. That's a perfect uh, conclusion for it. Yeah. I, would like to, I would like to thank the three of you for for joining the this uh, this session. Uh, we went a bit uh, over time, but it was definitely worth it. It was a super interesting discussion. Uh, good evening for everyone that was uh, following uh, live online, and thanks for all your intervention. And uh, have a great evening, and talk to you guys soon. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you.